remember, as the mission is being executed, vision is being realized, belong, believe, and behave. I want to finish up uh, my message from last week. And um, just won't be before you long, just a couple of things that I want to share that I think it's important that you hear um, as it relates to just some things that the Lord is sharing and as we've been talking about the whole issue of uh, radical discipleship to be who God would have us to be, amen. And Romans chapter, I, I didn't say one, did I? Yeah, I know, I kind of caught myself. I was replaying that in my head. I'm like, did I just say 14? Yeah, Romans 1, yeah, verse 14, yeah, yeah. That is not yeah. yeah. <laughs> Senior, that's not a senior moment. <laughs> that's the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spiritual man is there and the flesh man is just there. That's the tension. Yeah, amen. Romans, Romans chapter 1, yeah. Uh, let me tell you all something. If you don't be, if you're not coming out on Wednesday night, uh, you're missing some great, great intense discussions as it re relates to the things of God. So um, just if you can, if there's any way you can make it, we have some great services on Wednesday. So just make sure you're a part of that. Amen. Let me read um, verses 14, Romans 1, 14. And then I'm just going to review and I just want to share two new things with you. And then we'll wrap up and allow God to be God. Say amen if you're there. Paul writing to the church at Rome says this. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians or the non-Greeks in some of your translation both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. And then he says this in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, um, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17 says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then verse 17 says, for in it being the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous or the just shall live by faith. Um, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. I am commissioned and not ashamed. Come and turn to the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. I am commissioned and not ashamed. Amen. If you missed uh, last week's message, um, um, download the church's app or go to iTunes um, or I think it's even on YouTube now. Everything's on YouTube. And just type in Restoration Christian Fellowship. It'll come up and uh, listen to that message first. Um, and give them till maybe, I don't know, Monday afternoon to upload the other one. And then listen to this message again so it can sound like one thing, okay? <laughs> so it'll all make sense. Um, because what I want to do is I want to pick up and just make some clarifying things that I uh, believe we uh, said last week. Here's kind of the first thing that I share with you by way of just review. Number one, well, when we look at this text in verse 14 where Paul says, I am obligated to the Greek um, and the non-Greek or the barbarians, both to the wise and the wise, that's why I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. The first thing I wanted us to understand is because of our debt to Christ, we are obligated to go into the world and make disciples. We have an outstanding debt that we need to pay, and as a result, we have an obligation to go to the gospel. Now, I need to clarify some things that were said um, this past, last week, that might not have made sense. Um, this Wednesday, um, as we were kind of talking through to uh, the message and reviewing the message, when we looked at the word obligation, what that word obligation speaks to is one who has a, a commitment or a, you're under some sort of a um, commitment or something we've made to say we're going to repay a debt. So it says three here and then Wednesday question. Someone Wednesday raised the question, which I thought was extremely good. And the question basically says, okay, preacher, I hear what you're saying. I have an obligation to repay a debt. But I thought salvation was free. Come on, y'all. And so if salvation is free, why then is it do we have to repay a debt? 
I thought that was just such a brilliant question that I want to take a moment to review it because I know someone in here might have left out confused and not uh, sure what that's all about. So here's the response that I gave on um, Wednesday, and I want to reiterate that. Salvation is indeed free, okay? So one does not work to be saved, but they work because they are saved. Does that make sense? Come on, y'all been hearing that forever in church, right? But we're still not working. <laughs> yeah. 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 We- <laughs> I am sorry, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the truth, right? We've been hearing it forever. We, this is what we said. We, you, I don't work to be saved. I, but you, we said we're supposed to work because we are saved, but we're still not doing anything. And, and I, I wanted to take just a, just a brief minute in the short time that I have remaining to reflect on, on some things. So back up with me real quick to Exodus chapter 3. And let me just kind of share with you what I shared with the, um, with the group on Wednesday. And then we're going to move forward a little bit. Exodus chapter 3. Come on, y'all, let's get there, let's get there um, in record time like we would do in Bible study back in, what's it call it, sword drills back in the day? Yeah, Bible drill, that's what it is, yeah. Exodus chapter 3, and let me just kind of walk you through this, and, um, and then I want to share some things and pray that the Holy Spirit just do what the Holy Spirit does. If you're in chapter 3, say amen. amen. Now, here's what's happening in chapter 3. God is calling Moses to go to Pharaoh for the first time and to tell him to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, Exodus chapter 3 is a foreshadow of of Jesus coming into the earth to delivering us from salvation. So if you get down to verse 10 of chapter 3, after Moses made all these excuses and God said to them, um, look at verse 7, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. And I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land flown with milk and honey. And it tells you who the name of the land is. Now jump down to verse 10. So here's what God is saying to Moses. Now come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now look at the next verse. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, "Um, but I will be with you, God said to Moses, and this will be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve me on this mountain. Now, here's the one thing I want to say about that, and we must move to Ephesians real quick. Um, Yes, God did the delivering, and the thing I want you to hear in this passage, it cost the Israelites nothing for their deliverance. It was free, right? But don't miss the verse that says, a sign of the fact that it was God who delivered them was their service when they got to the mountain that God sent them to, okay? So here's what this looks like. Salvation is free, deliverance is free, but once we've been set free, there's an expectation that we work or serve God. Are you with me? And, and, and I don't have time to do with this, but if you read that verse carefully, the sign of your salvation is your service. Right? Because that's what he said. He, here's here's going to be the sign that I'm sending you when you get out. You're going to worship me here. So here's what happened. If they got out and they're not worshiping, are they really free or are they still in bondage? Okay. So go to the New Testament real quick. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Let me show you the same thing um, in New Testament context as you walk through this. Ephesians chapter 2 and then jump down to verse 8. Let's talk through that. Ephesians 2 and 8. Yeah, we need... (laughs) <laughs> and before I even read Ephesians, I, I miss this, but let me say it now. You and I are the Moseses. There's such a word. <laughs> we are the Moses plural that God is sending to the pharaohs of this world to tell him to release God's people. So here's what this looks like. If we're not going to Pharaoh and saying, let God's people go, we are being disobedient to God and causing people to be in bondage unnecessarily. Because we have the message of freedom. Make sense, guys? Okay. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Say amen if you're there. Verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And this not of your own doing, that means that it's free, it is a gift, okay? And verse 9 says, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Once again, salvation is free. But look at verse 10. But it says, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance or beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, here's the sum and the short of it as it relates to the debt that we need to repay. Yes, God set us free. God went on Calvary, died for our sins, and he delivered us. But now the B part of that clause is the reason he delivered you and the reason he delivered me is because he created us to work with him in the earth realm. Okay, so when he brings us out of the bondage, out of wherever we find ourselves, we now have an obligation to partner with God in bringing others out. Does that make sense? So repeat out of me, say, I'm obligated. Okay, now pause. Here's who Paul said I'm obligated to, to the Greek and the barbarians. Okay, so here's what this means to you, and here's what it means to me. I have an obligation to the unsaved world to let them know about Jesus. Make sense, guys? And I think you have the same. I think, I think you have the same obligation, too, to the unsaved world to let them know about Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let me move on, and let's talk through on some things um, in the time we have remaining. So our obligation to preach now, here's the thing. Our obligation to preach the gospel is based on the truth that the gospel addressed the shame of our past. Okay, now here's what this sounded like last week, and I don't have time to dig into it. The reason I am afraid to go back to the world and tell them about what God did for me or God did through me in delivering me and rescuing me is because I have not properly dealt with the shame of my past. Does anybody in here know sin is embarrassing? Come on, y'all. I mean, sin is not something that we do and we walk around, oh, girl, I sinned. No. <laughs> That's why they call them closets. That's why we have them hidden. That's why we have all that stuff. And I was clear last Sunday, and I repeated it Wednesday as, as well. I'm not saying that we need to go tell people our personal business. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is when we see somebody who was dealing with issues that God delivered us from, the least we can do is let them see us and say, been there, done that, God can bring me out. If God brought me out, God can brought you out, bring you out. Come on, does that make sense? Uh, come on, y'all, because, you know, I think I'm comfortable in saying, and, and I'm not trying to call anybody out, I'm comfortable in saying if I look out amongst this crowd, I think we might have representation of every types of struggles that people go through with in the earth. Come on. We might have representation of that here. And, and the reason you are here is because of what I'm going to share with you in a few minutes, that God brought you out. Now we have obligation to, when we see people who are where we were, Amen. to let them know that, listen, I did it, you can do it too. Does that make sense? So, so here's the thing. It's based on the truth that God has addressed the shame of our past. So what does that mean? That means to me today now that now that I am free, I shouldn't have to, my past shouldn't be, it, it may be an embarrassing thing, but it's not something that keeps me from being used by God. I, you know, um, when I was younger, I did this. I heard a preacher said this once, and I kind of went through this. He preached the message, and the title of the message was God Specializes in Rejects. Really, I did. And so I went and checked scripture out, and the only one somebody I found who was perfect was Jesus. All the rest of them had issues. Come on, y'all. And so I started to feel real good because I knew I had issues too. And I'm like, if God could use people that had failings and shortcomings and all that stuff, I sure know he can use me. And I want to bring the good news to you this morning that God can use you too. So the gospel has addressed the shame of our path. Now, there's, there's a couple of things that I want you to see as it relates to the gospel addressing the shame of our past is that there's two things I want you to understand about the gospel, okay? Number one, I mean, 2A means the gospel carries within its confines the power of deliverance. So let me say this this way. By default, by default, here's what happens by default. When you are born into the family of God, you are already delivered. 
I have a grandbaby that's going to be born in a couple of weeks. And I always tease my daughter, Veronica. I said, Veronica, does baby have all 10 toes and all 10 hands? And, you know, we kind of just, and she's like, <sighs> somebody didn't pray for me this morning, yeah. <laughs> 10 fingers. And, and here's what she says, dad, dad, you know. And, and the point that, that, that I want to make from that illustration is when that baby emerges from the earth, even though he might not know how to walk, he has all the faculties to be able to walk. Even though he might not know how to talk, he has all the faculty to be able to talk. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. By default, when you get saved, you have all the faculty you need to walk out your deliverance. <laughs> but hear me, hear me, hear me. You're already delivered. Okay? Hear that part. You're already delivered. That's, that's kind of implied in that word so-so where it says to rescue from danger. So go back to Romans. Let's kind of walk through this. I just want to share a couple of things. Here's what he said, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel um, of Christ. I'm not in that. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So number one, um, rescue from danger. And what that is, it's, it's, I put a little gr grammatical nuance. It's what's known as a generative of source. Let me tell you what that means. That means that you're not responsible for delivering you. God did all the delivering, okay? So the source of your deliverance is the finished work of God on Calvary in defeating the enemy. You got to hear this. So, so when we get saved spiritually, um, there's an instantaneous thing where we are now been made whole. So when you look at two, uh, number two under there, I kind of put this thing. There's a present and there's a future aspect of this whole issue of salvation, right? And so let me tell you what the future aspect first means, and then I'll talk about the present aspects. And we don't have time to go to Scripture, but I'll walk this out on Wednesday. In a future tense, what it means by the fact that you are saved, or if I may say being saved, means this, that in the end, God is going to come and, and, and take his church out of the earth, and then this thing known as the tribulation is going to come. He's going to destroy the earth. Okay, here's what this looks like in, um, in the book of Exodus, if you were to go back there. He was going to deliver his people from Egypt, so here's what he said to them. But for, so, I, so I can know who is mine, I want you to put blood on the sides and on the top of the lintel of your doorposts. And here's what he says, and then when I see the blood, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to pass, yeah, 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 y'all yeah. getting this. So here's what he's saying, future tense. Here's the future tense of salvation. By virtue of the fact that you've come to Christ, when he comes in tomorrow to consummate his church, guess what he's going to be looking for? Blood-stained Christians, right? And guess what that means? So when he comes in the future, in the end, the word is eschaton. When he comes in that end times, he's going to be able to identify all those who are is and then take them out of the earth. The beauty of that is that even though we're waiting for him to come back, we're already rescued. Y'all not, yeah. 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 I love scuba diving, and I have this crazy thing about me where I'm not afraid of the ocean water. I'm really not. So I never panic um, when I'm in the water because I feel, I just have a natural sense of being safe with water, right? Number one, I have this BC control thing on me that I can get air in it. If anything fails, I can pop myself up and float. Here's the thing that that is saying. Even though everything is broken with my system, broken with my gear, broken with all that stuff, I just need, by virtue of the fact that I have this thing on me, I just need to lay in the water and float. The boat's going to come. Yeah, y'all missed that. Yeah. In the earth, here's what he says. Don't worry about tomorrow what you're going to eat or drink. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Look at the lilies. They don't stress. Look at the birds. They don't toil. If your father takes care of them, guess what? He's going to take care of you. You just got to lay in the earth. The boat's going to come. The boat's going to come. Yeah. And he's guaranteeing you that while everyone around you is panicking, faking, trying to swim, you just got to lay there. The boat's going to come. That's what he's saying, you see. But here's the, here, here's the, the nerve-wrecking thing. He never tells us when the boat's going to show up. He just says, wait there. And it's in the waiting that we blow it. All right? That's future. That's future. Present is this. And you got to hear this with the present tense. You're already delivered. 
Man, that's hard for us. Because here's what the enemy will do. He will play with your head to make you think your issue is still an issue. You've got all the faculty to walk it out. Right? So here's the word sanctification, right? And, 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 and so here's, let me, let me put future and present together. So God has already revealed himself in the earth realm. And the more we stay with him, the more we look like him. I'm going to hit this in a little while. The easier it is to navigate the earth. You know the saints that's been saved for a thousand years? Grandma and them. Here's what grandma and them say to you, baby, it's going to be all right. Grandma, how you know? And she just looked at you. Been there. I used to be like you. <laughs> but the longer I live, baby, God's got it. We just have to learn that in our infancy, right? <laughs> that we're already rescued. And it's difficult for us. Does that make sense, guys? Okay? So, and the beauty of this verse, and I'm almost there. The beautiful, uh, beautiful part of this verse is that salvation is extended to everyone, to the Jew and then to the Greek. So turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, come on. You can make it in too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's for everyone. It, it's for everyone. And here's the good news. I just need to say this and I'm going to move on. Uh, there is no, nothing that says your sin is too bad or too grave or too whatever that God's going to skip over you. It doesn't matter what you did. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on. This is good news. This is good news. It, it, it doesn't matter what your yesteryear was. It doesn't matter what the failing is because Romans 5 and 8 still says his love was demonstrated while we were yet sinning. So guess what? While we were doing what it is we were doing, he was on Calvary paying the price for it in, irrespective of whatever it was that we were doing. So imagine this. What do you think you can do now that will cause God to stop loving you? Man, I'm not going to make it. Look at this last one real quick. It requires what? Come on, say faith. It requires what? For salvation to be active. It requires what? For salvation to be active. It requires what? For salvation to be active. I got to say one more time, somebody going to get it. It requires what? For salvation to be active. Y'all humor me one more time. It requires what? Faith for salvation to be active. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. I'm going to show you how simple this is. Look at verse 16. Say amen when you're there. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? The power of God, the genitive of source, for salvation to everyone who what? Come on, say what? That Greek word belief is the Greek word pistis, which is the same word translated faith in verse 17. Go down to verse 17. For in it, being the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed how? From faith to faith, as it is written, the just or the righteous is going to live how? Yeah, yeah. There's two things. There's two things I need to say about faith and Holy Spirit. We're just going to let you be God on this, okay? There's two things I need to say about this because this is where the enemy will play the most games in our mind. Salvation is not by works. It's by faith, okay? So paying your tithe does not save you. Coming to church does not save you. Buying appliances, yeah, I got it right, yeah, <laughs> does not save you. You kind of get what I'm saying. Works does not save you. So then what saves me, preacher? The finished work on Calvary, and I must have faith that I am saved. Let me explain, let me explain. So there's two components to this issue of faith. Number one, it's believing in God, but it requires what? Number one, a mental assent. Let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what that means. I have to say to myself in my mind that I am saved, and that's all it takes. Y'all ain't ready for that. You're not ready for that. You're not. I need to say to myself, that's the mental ascent, meaning that mentally I need to agree with God, okay? And here's the divine, the divine so I have some, some human responsibility and divine sovereignty. If I believe that God did it, I align with what God already did, and it's done. Okay? 
So my mental assent or me believing that God did it is not all that's required for me to be saved. God already did the work, so I have to align me mentally with what God already did spiritually, and I have to tell myself I am new in Christ because I really am, so I align this with what God did. So here's what this looked like, right, when he... When he um, would walk the earth. He would go around and there'd be a person that was crippled. I'm going to show you mental ascent and divine sovereignty. And the man would be laying on his bed and they'd say, can you heal him? And he'd say, yeah. And then Jesus would say, rise up, take your bed and walk. The man was already healed, whether he got up or not. Y'all, y'all missed that. Yeah, y'all, y'all. There is nothing that comes out of the mouth of God that's not true. God is not a man that he should lie. Y'all not hearing me this morning. So so lock into this. Hey, rise up, take your bed and walk. Divine ability, divine sovereignty had already been released, okay? He could have stayed there. And if 20 years later he decided to get up, guess what? He'd have still been healed and already been healed. And 20 years later he'd have been like, man, I've been laying like this for this long. When I was healed, the moment God told me I was healed... But here's what he had to do. He had to align his mind with what he just heard. And here's what the text says. And he picked up his bed. And he what? Yeah, yeah. The problem with a lot of us, we've heard it, but we don't believe it, so we're still laying there. So faith for salvation, for salvation, and I'm just on the front end of the word. The word sozo, the word sozo. Y'all be patient with me, okay? That, that, that the deliverance has already taken place. So listen to this. You don't have to be stuck on pornography if you don't want to. You don't need to have that sexual addiction if you've been saved if you don't want to. Whatever, 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 okay, whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is. That thing doesn't have you. You're letting it. So here's what it looks like. You're driving around Colfax. I don't see you just this right. And then let me not say liquor store no more. Let me say marijuana store. That's Colorado's problem, right? Now, nobody in here has that problem. That's a church across the street. And yeah. So you're driving down, and then the marijuana store is there. And the devil just, watch this, no smoke nowhere. All of a sudden, you start smelling stuff. I mean, nowhere. And, and devil so that he got you looking. Where that? Where that? Where that who, who getting high up? Here? Ain't nobody getting high. It's all inside. Yeah. And so watch what he does. He tries to get you to align mentally and physically with the thought he planted. And so here's what you do. You obey the lie and you turn. No different than your salvation. God already did it. And he's trying to get us to align mentally with what he's already done. So when the smell comes, ain't no smell up in here. You just keep driving. Right? Take those thought captives. Come on. Y'all know the scripture. You know it. You know it. It's just a thought. It's just a thought. It's not a reality. It's just a thought because you've been delivered. You've been set free. Take it captive and submit it to the things of Christ. That's just the front end of the word. You've been set free. Okay? The back part of the word, let me, see, let me see if I can get there. The back part of the word is not only have you been set free, but the gospel carries within its confines the ability to restore you to a new state. Oh, that, come on, y'all. That's the amen. That's the amen. That's the amen. It's like here's what this looks like with Paul and God, right? Is that God saves you, and then he starts over again. Look, 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 at, look at verse 17. And I'm going to stop. Look at verse 17. It says, for in it, meaning the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And I love this word from faith to faith, belief to belief, pistis to pistis. At is, as it is written, the righteous or the just shall live how? Okay. So here's the thing that that says in the word, the same word salvation. Salvation is not only a deliverance from but the B part of the word also mean a restoration too. So God forgives, and then in a scripture somewhere, he forgives, and he cleanses. 
he forgives, and he restores. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? So, so here's what that looks like. God is not the type of person that he'll forgive you for a sin, and every time he sees you, he like, mm -hmm. I know it. I know it. I knew it. Hey, Jesus. Hey, Holy Spirit, what I tell you? I'm going to win this bet. Yeah. <laughs> that does not happen in heaven. And here's the, here's the thing that you got to hear me say. Hear me say this. In God's vocabulary, when we come to him, he doesn't say, again? He doesn't. Yeah, you got to hear that. He doesn't do that. It's every instant is isolated and it's the first time in his. You got to get this. Because forgiveness and restore means he covers you with his blood. He cleanses you. Come on, you got to hear me. And he gives us a fresh start. He restores us to the former state, meaning that our sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. The problem is not God. It's humans. Is that they can't forget. They can't release. They can't let go. And here's what the devil will do. He will use humans to convict us. You got to get past that. We got to get past that, right? So he, he restores us to the former state. And then there's two interesting words here that has to do with righteousness. What's called forensic and transformative. Let me explain, I'm, and I'm done. The forensic side of transformation of, um, of what's the word? Righteousness kind of stands like this. When God looks at you, you're clean. He declares you right. Just as if you've never sinned. Come on, sinners, that's a good word. Yeah. Talking to myself, too. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to myself. Sometimes I be praying, Lord, let my wife be God. Because <laughs> she remember everything. <laughs> Lord, if it even looked like something I did, <laughs> she remember. Right? But God doesn't do that. So forensically, what that means is that he overlays us with righteousness that when he sees us, he doesn't see the frailty that we did. This, oh, come on, y'all. It's good news. So here's what that does. It allows me in my sinful state to approach him sinless. So it opens the door for prayer. It opens the door for worship. It opens the door to come into his gates with thanksgiving. Come on now. Because he covers me. He washes me. Does this make sense? That's the forensic side. He, he overlays me with his righteousness. Here's the transformative side. Here's what that means. And once again, there's an there's a already and a not yet. Here's what that looks like. That, that, that he comes from where he comes from. And he, he saves me. And he gives the, me the ability to continue to grow, to become like him. So here's what that means. Every day I live, he forms me, and he transforms me, and he shapes me, and he molds me to become more like him. And so who I am today is not who I was yesterday. Who I'm going to be tomorrow is not who I am tomorrow. Come on, today. And who I'm going to be a year from now, if I stay on the journey, he continues to mold me. And watch this. His righteousness becomes mine. So after a while, I stop lying. Come on, come on. His righteousness becomes mine. After a while, I stop stealing. His righteousness becomes mine. After a while, I stop committing fornication. His righteousness becomes mine. After a while, I start looking more and more like him because of the transformative work that he does in me. But while he's working on me, forensically, when he sees me, he sees himself. Ah. Oh. I, this is good stuff, y'all, because it helped me. Because there's times when I feel bad about me. Come on, y'all. There are times when I feel in my sin, man, I failed God. I've blown it. I don't know why. God forgive me. And he just tells me, baby, it's all right. Forensically, I've overlaid this stuff on you. Keep working transformatively. I'm going to keep molding you to look like me. Ah. The power of the gospel. So Paul says, for in the gospel now, a righteousness is revealed from what? Faith to faith. So my funny word again. So mentally, I have to assent to the fact that I'm forgiven. By way of divine sovereignty, I am already forgiven. You guys see how this works? So I've got to put myself to work to believe that God did what God already did and start to speak down to the devil, speak up to God, and I'm going to make it. So here's what this looks like by way of radical discipleship. 
that person who wronged me, that I bump into them at Starbucks, and God says, you have an obligation to that person. Here's what I can't do. I cannot remember what they did. Oh. <laughs> I have an obligation because when God sees me, here's the application, he does not remember. But yeah, yeah, yeah. He just overlays grace. And so I'm obligated to say to the Greek and the barbarian, God loves you. God can save you. God can deliver you. Come on, y'all. Does this make sense? God can do what God wants to do in you. So as a result, I'm a radical disciple. I'm commissioned and I'm not ashamed, right? And so here's the big idea I've been trying to get to for two weeks now. The gospel has the power to deliver and to restore anyone to Christ. So Christians now are obligated to preach its truth, considering how he freed us from the shame of our past. Considering how he did it. I am a debtor. Not paying my salvation, paying the reason I was saved back. Let them go that they may serve me to do the works he created in advance for me to do. So imagine the early church. Come on, worship team. The days of the early church. You wonder why Paul and Peter and them, and they were so radical for Christ. You wonder why they said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Because they understood the obligation they had because they knew who they were pre-Christ and what God wanted to do through them. My challenge to you this morning, my challenge to all of us who name the name of God, is that we have an obligation to tell a lost and dying world about a Savior who came to seek and to save that which was lost. Here's the B-side. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have not said yes, boy, if there's any reason to come to Jesus today, I think we presented it. I think we presented it. Are you with me? So saints all over this place, I need you praying. That if there's one that haven't said yes to God, man, that they would come. And say to him, God, I want to know you like that. If it's nothing, Lord, but thank you for forgiving me, come. If it's just that. If it's just that. Bow your heads with me. Come on, Pastor Tani. Lord, you're wonderful, God. You're gracious. You're mighty. You're awesome. You're mighty, God. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for the finished work of Jesus on Calvary. Thank you for who you are and what you're doing. Draw, God, draw, God, draw, God, draw, God, draw, 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 draw. As only you can do it. We love you this morning. Thank you for being God. Thank you for loving us in spite of. In your name we pray and thank you. Now, God, if there's one, if there's one, if there's one, if there's one, bring him. Bring him, Lord. Bring him. Bring him to you. Not to the church, to you. In your name we pray. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Oh.